So last time uh, we started to talk about this interesting feature that though the Malthusian world is one which is static in terms of living standards, uh, life expectancy, um, economic growth, there's no economic growth, it turns out that interestingly, it's actually a world which is showing a lot of changes in basic fundamental human behaviors. And so I just started to go through these various changes uh, that are occurring. And the first one is something called uh, time preference. And the question is, well, how do we measure time preference, right? And time preference is just the basic general human feature that we prefer things now as opposed to later. That given the opportunity to have the same consumption now as opposed to a year from now, we will actually pay a premium in order to have the good now as opposed to later. It's an odd uh, human propensity. Philosophers have debated about whether it reflects a fundamental irrationality in people's makeup, but it's a common feature of uh, all individuals. Another interesting feature is that it actually varies across uh, different individuals. Some individuals are much more patient than others, even within any society. And the question is, how do we measure time preference? And the way that time preference shows up in economic systems is through the existence of positive interest rates. In the world since the Industrial Revolution, for risk-free investments, for the safest assets that you can invest in, the rate of return has been something around about 3% in real terms. But in the modern world, we also actually have tax systems that tax away some of that rate of return. And so the implied real rate of return that people need in order to engage in these safest investments since the Industrial Revolution seems to have been about only 2%. And uh, that, as I say, it doesn't seem to have changed very much in the last 200 years in advanced uh, high-income economies. How do we measure uh, interest rates when we go back uh, to the early world? What I described last time is that there are lots of ways in which interest rates creep into economies and which we can actually use uh, to measure these. There's just the ratio of the rental of any asset relative to its price. So land is the longest lived of all the assets. That's the easiest one to use this ratio to measure returns. There's also housing, which is a very long lived asset. You can also even look at things like cows. It turns out that even in places like medieval England, there's a rental market in cows. You can rent a cow by the year. It's just like we go to U-Haul or whatever and rent there. There you can actually rent out these cows for a season. And so you can actually look at the ratio of, well, what's the rental price of a cow relative to the price of a cow outright? And there's a lot of depreciation in the case of cows, but it actually gives you an idea again about uh, interest rates. Another thing is, what's the movement of grain prices uh, between harvests? Right? Uh, how rapidly do they move up between harvests? Again, that's embodying the underlying interest rate in the society. And so there's lots of different ways that we can measure this. And the interesting fact that we find is, all pre-industrial societies have high interest rates compared to the modern world, is the first finding. And the second finding is, the further back we go, the higher these interest rates tend to be. There has been some unexplained and very major decline in interest rates from the earliest societies to the eve of the Industrial Revolution. And modern interest rates were only achieved in societies like the Netherlands and England within about 200 years of the onset of the Industrial Revolution. Before that, all the societies we can observe have surprisingly high rates of interest. One of the places we can measure this uh, very well is Europe around about 1300. And we can see interest rates in Italy, France, Germany, uh, Belgium, England. Uh, we see it as the return on land. We see it as these rent charges where people sell part of the land rent in advance. And the answer in all of these societies around about this period is that the real interest rate is somewhere between 10 and 
And that actually is um, an astonishingly high interest rate. The people who thought in the modern world that they were getting an incredible deal with Barony Madoff, what was their return? He was offering about 10% per year in real terms. And they thought, I mean, people were rushing. People were desperate to meet Bernie Madoff, right? But in this world, in Europe in 1300, any investor could get Madoff-like returns year after year. And unlike Madoff, there wasn't actually any risk in these investments. It wasn't a scam. It was a safe and reliable return that was actually available uh, to people in these societies. And so land returned about 10%. These rent charges returned about 10%. If you stored grain between the harvests, on average, its price went up about 15%. You had to, some of that's the storage cost. You have to actually have space to put it, and some of it's depreciation. But we think that farmers got an implied return of 10 or 12% in storing grain in this world between the harvests. And so it's a pervasive feature of this society that interest rates are in the range of uh, 10 to 12%. Uh, and as I say, that we'll see in a second. You know, how do we explain why returns are so high in these early societies? But it's a fundamental difference between that society and our society. Medieval English rates are high, but if we go to medieval England, there we get again some records from temple uh, records of, of endowments that were given to the temple for some purpose. It was invested in land. Uh, those returns are in the range of 10 to 20% in the case of medieval Ingli Indian temples. But these returns all actually look relatively low compared to what was available in the very ancient world. And so the, the precursor to ancient Babylon is the civilization of Sumer in uh, the Middle East. And we have records there from between 3,000 to 1900 BC, right? So we're talking about a period 4,000 to 5,000 years ago, right? And so those are the, the earliest interest rate quotes uh, that people have. And remember, that's because of the use of this uh, clay tablets in order to record economic transactions and the survival of these tablets. Um, what are the rates that are quoted? Well, for loans denominated in silver, Typical interest rates quoted here are 20 to 25%. These are fantastic returns that well, people were paying in order to borrow money in this society, right? This is like credit card debt now, okay? <laughs> and, but these are not, you know, these are loans made to secure real estate transactions for very stable and safe investments that have been made in this society. But as I say, with these enormous rates of return. Uh, the other place that we get these quotes is Babylonia, uh, 1900 to 732 BC. Uh, what are the returns that are being offered? Again, typically on things like housing loans, other transactions, it's in the range of 10 to 25%. And so there's a table in the book that gives the actual details of all of this. But the, just the two crucial things to remember are the further back you go, the higher these rates of return tend to be. In almost all the pre-industrial societies we can observe, returns tend to be very high. It's also the case for the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century that loan rates are 10 to 20 percent. It's the case for Tokugawa, Japan in the 17th century, again, that loan rates are in the region of 10%. And so it's just a general feature of the world. It's kind of interesting feature that if you go back far enough in time, returns are very, very high. Now, economists are going to, how, how do you interpret this? Okay. Oh, and, and by the way, how can we go back even further in time? Right? It, it turns out that that's very difficult because these are all societies with explicit loan mar markets and also with the idea of rates of interest. Um, what about hunter-gatherer society? What are rates of interest in hunter-gatherer society? There's no explicit loan market 
in hunter-gatherer society, but anthropologists have actually tried to figure out what are the kind of underlying interest rates that hunter-gatherers work with. And because in any society, as I say, there's, there's an implicit interest rate in all of our activities. Right? And one of the things that they can do is look at the different work activities that people can in engage in. Some of these involve an investment element, but a later return, and some of them involve an immediate return. And there's a dramatic example from a tribe in Madagascar, in Makea, which is studied in the last 10 or 20 years. And they live in the forest there, and they can engage in two types of activity. Uh, the first type of activity is foraging. And the anthropologists can measure what their productivity is. And so if they go foraging, on average, they can generate 1,800 kilocalories per hour, okay? which is actually a very nice return, right? because you only need you know, 2,000, 3,000 to live per day. And so you can you know, get a fair amount of food. This is a Big Mac uh, that you can generate, more than a Big Mac that you can generate with an hour's work in this society. Okay? Uh, and so, as I say, these, these rates of return are reasonably good. But there's another activity that they can engage in, which is just to clear a space in the forest and plant uh, corn. Okay? Uh, and all the labor input that's involved in that is just a little bit of preparation. You plant the corn, and then you have to come back and weed it at some point, and then you eventually come back and harvest it. What's the return from planting corn? It's reported to be 74,000 kilocalories per hour. <laughs> it's such an incredible investment that it pays off in terms of, for one hour's work, will generate 74,000 kilocalories. Right? And the puzzle that the anthropologists ask is, well, why is anyone bothering foraging in this society? <laughs> Why isn't everyone just out planting corn? Right? Uh, and there's plenty of, of spare land. Right? Uh, and the argument that they make is, well, it's because corn takes a while to grow. Right? And it's an investment activity. You have to do it now and then anticipate in three months, four months, that the product will be there for you. And that because people have this very high implicit interest rate that they're operating with, they're not that interested in these investment type activities. They prefer to go foraging rather than go and spend the day in preparing a, a patch of corn in the forest. And that actually just seems unbelievable in terms of the relative difference in the returns that are available across these, these two uh, groups. Another thing that anthropologists report is that we often think of uh, hunter-gatherers as being kind of in tune with nature, as you know the original conservationists, they'd have membership in the Green Party automatically. Um, it turns out that uh, often these groups have ranges where they, they have resources that they go systematically to every year. And there'll be fruit trees that they harvest every year. Um, at least in some cases, in order to make it getting easier for the fruit, they'll just chop down the fruit tree. <laughs> right? Even though that means that it's not going to be there next year. Or uh, there's another group uh, who harvest honey uh, in the forest, and the honey uh, nests are up in the trees, they'll just chop down the tree in order to get the honey, right? And so uh, hunter-gatherers may be conservationists, but it's not by nature, right? I mean, it's just by the, 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 the world they live in. It turns out that the evidence seems to be that hunter-gatherers actually, if anything, have even higher rates of kind of interest that they're operating with than in modern societies. And so this is an interesting feature. And the question then is, well, why did the world change in that way? Why did people start out as a, you know, showing apparently this impatience? And uh, why did you know, interest rates decline as we move to the modern world? And if you're thinking about the interest rate, so if R is the real interest rate in any society, economists think of that as composed of three different elements. There's rho, which is people's underlying rate of time preference. And what economists would like to believe is that essentially rho is the same across all societies. Right? And because in the modern world, interest rates have fallen, as I say, to effectively something like 
The item would be that under, we have this time preference, but it's relatively modest. It's, it's an underlying 2%, right? And that's going to appear in any society. And then there's another element, D, which is the element of risk, right? Any investment activity involves risk. It involves the risk that the asset will disappear, be expropriated, be destroyed. It also involves the risk that you won't be allowed to collect the return on the asset, right? And so there's this mutual risk of the asset disappearing or you disappearing, okay? And so that's an element that has to come into the calculation. But there's a further factor, which is the growth rate of income, and that'll be multiplied by some other constant. And that positive income growth rates, the argument is, will actually be associated with higher interest rates in any society. Now, why is that going to be the case? Well, I imagine a world where we just, we harvest fruit every year, but it's only available for that year, right? That's how we live. <laughs> imagine we're going from a year of low yields, and we know that next year there'll be high yields. In that case, everyone would like to borrow against the future. <laughs> They're going to have a lot of income next year. There's a lot of fruit to eat next year, but there's not much this year. And so if, the, if things are getting better, then what's happening is everyone will actually be wanting to borrow against the future, and it'll drive up the interest rate in the society. So think about our society where we expect economic growth on average. We expect life to get about 2% better every year. That means that young people in our society think, well, by the time I'm 40, I'm going to be earning a significantly higher income, right? Why should I drive around in this Kia, you know? I need to have a BMW, right? <laughs> I need to kind of smooth my consumption out over my life, you know, lifetime. And in a society where there's just consistent economic growth, the argument is that most people want to be borrowers. The thing that's going to stop them being borrowers is that interest rates have to rise to the point where they say, I'm willing to wait because I can consume so much more in the future. Okay? We actually see dramatic examples of that. And one that comes from the settlement of California uh, by the Anglo population in the 1850s. And so people were flooding into California. Uh, there was a huge amount of investment that was needed in the Central Valley to take what had been former swampland and transfer it into this highly productive uh, farmland. What were mortgage rates on land and housing in California in the early 1850s? The answer is they were about 50% per year. Right? Why are they so astonishingly high? It's because everyone wants to invest at that time. Everyone has low incomes initially, but everyone's anticipating these much higher incomes that are coming sooner. And so you have to pay a lot in order to borrow money to make those investments in California in that period. It's just a sign of the incredible growth that was being expected in the income uh, within uh, California. And see, we know that under the right conditions, you can take people with this underlying relatively low time preference rate and translate that into a very high interest rate if you're going to be in a society with a lot of economic growth. However, what do we know about the Malthusian world? No economic growth. No economic growth before 1800. What does that imply, just that factor alone, in terms of the movement of interest rates from the pre-industrial to the modern world? What should have been happening is, that should have been a world with astonishingly low interest rates. And then as growth started in the Industrial Revolution, interest rates should actually have moved upwards. And so the growth element that economists know matters in terms of determining interest rates, what that actually is just reinforcing the puzzle. If you live in a society where every year you expect incomes are going to be absolutely flat in the future, that should be the society where interest rates are very, very low. Right? If you live in very high income society, the high income society now where incomes, incomes are growing steadily, these should be relatively impatient looking societies because of this fact that we're all anticipating we're going to get richer in the future, right? If we lived in a world where incomes were anticipated to decline steadily, <laughs> interest rates should become even lower, right? Because everyone, in fact, would like to uh, lend now uh, so that they can have a store of income for the future, okay? Uh, 
And so the funny thing is, uh, if we're going to explain these pre-industrial interest rates, this will not help us. What are we left with? We're assuming that this is constant. The only thing that then can possibly explain this would have to be that somehow in all pre-industrial societies, asset holding was very risky. That it's just a reflection of some basic institutional difference that assets are all inherently risky. Now, as I say, there's two elements to that risk. One element is that if you're you know, at prime age, people like you have an astonishingly small risk of death in any given year, particularly if you don't get into a car. Right? <laughs> Stay away from cars and you actually have a very modest risk of death in any year. And so it's, it's, in fact, it's so small that you can almost completely disregard it. Even at the best of times in this world, even though life expectancy at age 20 was about 30 years, it was still the case that even people in their prime earning years faced significant risks of death in any given year, maybe 1%, 1.5%. Right? And so they actually face significantly greater risks of death. And so another argument might make is, well, the reason people behave with such impatience in this world is because they don't know if they're going to be around to enjoy consumption. And that what they're doing then is that they're simply uh, saying it's time to party, <laughs> right? Because if we don't know what the future is, then why bother investing, right? It's not like you can just stash away all that money and say, well, at age 60, then we'll really get to get the benefits of consumption. Can that explain the high interest rates of the pre-industrial world? Well, one thing that actually turns out is that the capital market can actually compensate you for that risk. The way it would compensate you is through what are called annuities. Those are investments where you only get a return if you're actually around and still alive in order to collect the return. Then what's going to happen is if 1% of people are dying every year, it drives up the rate of return that's available to those who actually hang out and collect. And so in that case, what will actually happen is the market will perfectly kind of reward you for that, and it will say, look, we can offer you a much better rate of return here, <laughs> right? And, and so that it, it would say that the underlying rate of interest actually doesn't have to be inherently small. And it turns out that even in medieval Europe, they had annuities. But the more important calculation about that personal risk is, remember, this again is a static world. That personal risk was no lower around 1800 than it was in hunter-gatherer society, in ancient Rome, or in ancient Babylonia. And yet, within that period, we see interest rates drop from 20% down to 3%. <laughs> okay? And so we see this dramatic decline within that Malthusian era, even though there's no systematic increase in life expectancy as you move through the Malthusian world. And so it can't be the personal risk. It's got to be the risk to the assets that people are investing in. And so that raises the question is, and it's very hard to kind of measure that risk because it's not just about the actual risk, it's also about the perception of risk that people have, right? And it's the perception that's going to matter in terms of uh, people's investment within these societies. Can we tell if that risk was great enough to explain these high returns? If we take something like medieval England, I'd say, which had this 10 or 12% real rate of return, we can actually show that that risk seems to be astonishingly small. Uh, one of the things you can invest in is just ordinary farmland. We have all the records of these little farms, sorry, at least villages, where people are investing in the manorial court. We still have all of those court records, right, to this day. Um, when we look at these villages, what's actually happening is that you don't see, you see that the land just gets transferred from person to person. There are a lot of villages in England where literally nothing happened for 600 years, right? There's lots of these villages where the court records just go from year to year. Stuff is transferred. There's no great incidence. There's no destruction. There's no cost. It's a very, very stable and very safe world in a lot of these places, right? And as I say, that's in part just a reflection of the fact that the English tended to fight abroad <laughs> in the medieval period and had very little civil war or, or disruption within the country, right? If you went to the north of England, the Scots are always raiding. 
then you would see much more of this. But we've got tons of areas in the south where exactly this return is there. It's, it's 10%, right? So that's the first thing. The other thing that you can see in these land markets is that land prices are incredibly stable, so that there's actually very little asset risk in the terms of losing the money that you invest. You can know if I invest now, 10 years from now, I'll sell the stuff for the same price as now. Right? It's, it's really safer almost than, than any assets you can invest in in the modern world. There is this issue about the legal system. I mean, the legal system had these peculiarities. And so I, I mentioned before that one thing you had to be careful is if I sell you a piece of land, you better make sure that all my relatives are on board with this transaction as well, because you don't want my grandson coming back and saying, hold on, I didn't agree to that transfer of title. Okay? And so you had to be careful in transferring title to make sure that all these collateral claims are dealt with. Right? And so you'll actually see these transfer documents where A sells to B, but then A's wife signs a thing saying, I release all my claims to this. Right? A's daughter signs a claim saying, I release all my claims to it. Right? And so there were peculiarities in this system. Uh, interestingly, it turns out that even though uh, England had a national law, national courts in, in the medieval period, the king would actually sell the right to various cities to set up their own legal system. Right? As I say, this is a very fluid, very dynamic world. The, the problem of the kings all the time is they don't have any money. Right? They're starved from funds. They want to fight the French, they want to fight other people, but you need money in order to do that. Right? Most of their troops are actually mercenaries, and so you need, you need the goods. Right? Uh, how are they going to raise money? Parliament won't let them increase taxation. People hate taxation. Right? This is, it's like being in Texas. Right? Uh, and, and so they can't get money that way. But it turns out that justice is a source of profit. Because in the courts of the king, typically if someone injures someone else, the penalty, they don't put people in prison in the medieval period. The penalty often will be you have to pay a fine to the king. And so selling, setting up justice systems is actually a well-recognized source of profits. And there are also local justice systems and these little villages, the manor, would have its own court. That was accounted as one of the profits that the lord got from the manor because there were all these other things that you could find people for. And so justice was actually a nice source of profit. So what would actually happen is that cities which didn't want to fall under the king's jurisdiction because of all the, the bizarre elements of this jurisdiction could go to the king and say, we want to buy out justice for the city. <laughs> we'll pay you a lump sum or we'll pay you an annual fee in order that we can set up our own legal system. And so that then we can actually, in the case of London, we could have merchants control the courts that, that limit the disputes between merchants, right? So because we best understand what our legal needs are, we don't want this one justice serves all. By the way, in, in California now, there's also a private justice system that runs. Because what happens is, for commercial clients, if you have a lawsuit that's in the, the regular legal system, it'll take you years to get the thing heard. So what happens is, parties agree to hire retired judges who will judge by the laws of the state of California, <laughs> but do this on an entirely private basis. And then they'll, they'll just agree to be bound by that transaction. And so that if you want speed in a legal system, you can actually arrange it. <laughs> right? And so you can actually, you know, and, and private parties which are going to be encumbered by the, the slowness, the, the incredible pace uh, of this legal system can actually find their own justice even within the modern world, right? And just agree to set up a private parallel justice system, okay? And so this was what happened in the medieval period. And so the major cities across England had mostly, by the year 1200 or 1210, had actually bought the right to run their own courts. And so what that meant was that they actually then had the, the ability to set up rules of property that they were their own. In that case, if we thought that the reason rates of return were very high in the medieval period was because the legal system made possession of anything very risky, what we'd expect to find then is that some of these cities would actually have set up a legal system which would have dissolved that problem and where you'd see modern rates of return. 
that it maybe not every city, but it, you know, in Canterbury, in Norwich, in Bristol, in York, someone would have solved that problem. Given that there's 20 or 30 at least major cities that have their own legal systems in this period, the interesting thing is we can measure these rates of return in a variety of these cities, and the answer is it's always 10%. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're falling under the king's courts, if you're falling under manorial courts, if you're falling under the private you know, legal systems of these cities. There's an underlying basic rate of return in this society, and the answer seems to be that it's actually 10%. Another worry about the medieval system is that calculating interest rates is a little difficult. Um, the way they would actually quote interest rates is they didn't even have the concept of an interest rate there. What they would measure is something called the year's purchase. And so how they would estimate the value of any asset is they would say, well, what's the rent of it? And then we have to multiply it by some number, the year's purchase, to say how much that should be worth. It's just the inverse of the interest rate. right? It's just, it's the price divided by the rent is what they used, as opposed to the rent divided by the price, right? And the reason for that is the year's purchase could be quoted as a whole number, right? Because remember, they're using Roman numerals. It's very hard to do fractional arithmetic in this world. And so, but it actually will work perfectly well, right? It's mathematically, it's just a transformation of the interest rate. Uh, the, the one worry is, well, did they just quote interest rates of 10%? Because that's an easy number to multiply, right? Because it says year's purchase is 10. <laughs> and if you're dealing with Roman numerals, did they just stick with that number? But we can actually look at individual transactions there. And while you'll see that 10 is very common, 12 is also used, 13.33 is also used, 8 is also used, they're actually, there's variation. Right? There's actually quite a lot of variation in terms of the actual individual transactions. It's not just some incredible algorithm that they're engaged in where they just don't know how to value anything and they just say, look, just give me 10 times right, what the rent is. That'll do. Okay? And so the interesting thing then is that you really do have this world where people seem to have these very high rates of time preference in this early society. And that means that they seem to have a fundamental difference in psychology. That even English people in 1300 are just behaving in a fundamentally different way. Their individual psychology is very different. Because this is a society where no one needs to be poor. If you're offered a 10 or 12 percent real rate of return, then over your lifetime you can transform your economic circumstances. Right? You, can, you can go from being a landless laborer to being the richest guy in the village, if you really want to do that, just by investing 10% of your income every year. By the time you got through 30 years of that, you're going to have a large stock of land that you'll own in that village. And you can accumulate that land half acre by half acre. It's sold in very small units. It's sold in very convenient parcels. Right? And so it, and the interesting thing is that people looked at that prospect in the medieval world and simply said, no, we're not interested. Another reflection of this, actually, is that because of these high interest rates, the medieval cultivators probably all across Europe actually dramatically destroyed the landscape. The way they did this is the following. It turns out in this pre-industrial system, you need nitrogen is the big constraining element in terms of the growth of plants. Uh, an acre of land taken in from forest or something like that will have something like 5,000 pounds of nitrogen in it. But if you grow wheat or barley or oats, if you grow grains on that land and only grains, it steadily takes away from that stock of nitrogen. And once that stock is depleted, it becomes hard, very hard to grow anything on the land, right? So anyone. If you know, I live in East Davis, where lawn care it doesn't tend to be of a very high standard. And you could see a lot of lawns there, which if you keep cutting the grass and stuff like that, and, and, and you keep depleting, you, know, you can actually, again, have this nitrogen-deprived grass. And then that's where you have to go to Ace Hardware and get the chemicals, right, and put them back on. Right? So that's what we do in the modern world. We use petroleum to fix nitrogen from the air, and that's one of the foundations of our modern high-productivity agricultural system. They didn't have this possibility in the pre-industrial world. The way, though, they could fix nitrogen is simply by growing grass or clover on the land. It's very effective nitrogen fixer. And then you have to 
have that grass grazed by animals or fed to animals and return the manure to the land, keep recycling this stuff, and you could actually maintain relatively high productivity. English farmers by 1800, without any knowledge of science, had figured out that that's what you need to do. The amazing thing in the medieval period is that they dramatically depleted the nitrogen stock in these fields. We estimate that in some cases they had brought it down to something like 1,000 pounds of nitrogen that was left per acre. Their yields consequently were such that when they planted wheat, they considered themselves lucky if for every seed they planted, they got three back. But remember, one of those had to go back into the ground for the harvest next year, so they were basically getting two for every one that they planted. <laughs> By 1800, yields were about 10 for every one that was being planted in uh, agriculture in this period, in, in 1800, right? So that actually they were living, they, had, they were getting about less than half, maybe a third of the potential output that they could have got through their agricultural system. And it tends to be that people think, well, they just didn't understand, right? It's just, it's very hard to figure this out. They just didn't understand. It turns out that they knew everything they needed to know to double or triple the output of that ag early agricultural system. How do we know that? When they leased land in that period, they perfectly understood that if you grow grass on land and keep it growing for a while, it makes it very fertile. So they would have stipulations in lease that said, if I lease you a grass field, you have to return that field to me as grass, right? You can't start growing grain on it because we know that that's going to deplete the fertility. They knew that grass restored fertility. And even better, they had these large uh, open fields and they would be divided up into many small plots. And so they had to have these entryways so that they could get access to the various parts of the field. Year after year, the plots would grow grain. It would deplete most of the fertility. These entryways, though, had grass growing on them. Also, the animals would move up and down here. So what would actually happen is, after a while, this would be fertile. <laughs> this would be barren. In some places, they actually switched the fields around so that they could then start putting you know, the, end, the, the, the roadways on the barren part. And then they knew that this other part, which hadn't been cultivated for a while, was fertile. So they knew that if you just left land alone and didn't cultivate it for something like 10 years, it would restore its fertility. It only takes about 10 or 20 years out of cultivation for it to have double or triple the amount of fertility. And even if you're, you're not, even if you keep it in grass, you can actually graze animals on it so you don't completely lose the return in that period. So we actually know that in the medieval period, they knew how to restore fertility. They just decided to keep the land as a desert. Right? And why would they do that? Well, it turns out if interest rates are 10%, it can be absolutely rational to engage in that. It can be absolutely rational to take the land out of forest, start mining the fertility, leave it a desert, and say it's not worthwhile actually trying to restore the fertility in this land. Because anything like that is actually an investment. It says, well, we have to stop growing wheat now put it aside for 10 or 20 years, and then we can restore the fertility completely, and then we could start again. <laughs> On average, if we, if we do this, over the long run, we can sustain much higher returns if we simply take land in and out of cultivation like that. But with a high enough interest rate, the argument can be just depleted. It. it just, I mean, it's better off because the future doesn't matter, <laughs> right? And if I can even get a small higher return now, I'd much rather do that than have doubled the return for every year in the future. Okay? And so it's interesting that we think that these high interest rates also affected the potential output of the society. As I say, we're in a Malthusian world. Had they actually had lower interest rates, what would have happened is they'd have had higher population. It wouldn't have actually, in the long run, increased living standards. But it's interesting that you can explain features that are otherwise very bizarre about the society once you see this fact that you know, they're just operating with these very high interest rates. And so that's one thing that's, that's fundamentally different in this early world is that people have these high rates of time preference. What's the next thing that's surprising about this early world? The next thing that's surprising is just how innumerate and illiterate people were even in what we think of as very advanced societies of the ancient world. 
So we think of the Greeks and the Romans as having reached this kind of high point of civilization that was not recaptured in Europe until, say, even the 15th or 16th century. The surprising evidence is that the average rich person in ancient Greece or ancient Rome was probably illiterate and innumerate. And how do we uh, actually get evidence on this? Uh, well, there's a nice uh, uh, feature. I mean, uh, there's, there's two ways we can get evidence. One is, could people sign their name? Okay, that's actually very, it, it turns out to be a very simple measure of literacy, and you can get it in a lot of societies. But there's a second feature which actually reveals people's numeracy, which is something called age keeping. Now, just to illustrate this, we have the records, some legal records produced by a guy called Aurelius Isidorus, who was a landowner in Roman Egypt in the third century AD. And it happens that his legal documents and our, a bunch of them have actually survived in this period. Okay? And we have five of them where he gives his age. And so we have here the date and the age that he declares and the birth year that that's going to imply. Okay? So this is a guy, remember, who's, who's a landowner, right? He's a wealthy guy. He's entering into legal contracts. And so the first age declaration we have is in the year 297 AD. And he declares himself to be 35, and that was implying that he was born in 262 AD. The next age declaration is in 308, and it's actually in April of 308. That's 11 years later. He's become 37. <laughs> so it implies that he was born in 271. Okay. Uh, the next age declaration is also in 308. It's in August. So this is in April of 308. This is in August of 308. He's now 40, <laughs> implying he was born in the year 268. Then we get another contract in 309. Now he's 45. <laughs> that implies he was born in 264. And then, again, later in 309, he gives a declaration. Now he's decided he's 40 again. And that implies he was born in 269. What's interesting is this guy clearly has no idea what age he is. And he's not that old, <laughs> right? <laughs> he's not that old. But he clearly has no idea. These are com all completely inconsistent, right? And, and the, and, but what's interesting about this is, uh, well, two things are interesting. One is that Egypt actually had a census every seven years so that age knowledge actually in general in Egypt is actually pretty good because they would update you every seven years in the census. You'd appear first time when you're, you know, soon after you're born, and then every seven years they came back and collect the census. But what's interesting about this is People who don't know their age will tend to make guesses that are round numbers. And so what you'll see is that four of these five declarations either end in a zero or a five. And societies which have a decimal number system, age declarations of people who don't know their name, who don't know, who know their age, uh, tend to actually cluster around zero or five. And so what it means is that if we have any group in that society where we have age declarations, we can actually use that to figure out how numerate are people in that society, how aware are they of things like how old am I in this society. This, by the way, the, 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 the lack of numeracy in, in poor societies is one reason why they, they, they often find these clusters in some remote valley in the Andes. They'll find a bunch of people who are 120, right? And typically, that's because these are people who, who don't know their age, right? And, and who just, as you get older, you know, there's a status associated with being high age. And so people just start inventing stuff or believing stuff, right? So that what we can actually do is actually systematically use this tendency of people in enumerate societies to have age cluster around these numbers. And we can construct a measure, which we'll call z, of age heaping, which is going to be 
5 over 4 times x minus 20, where x is simply the percentage of ages that end in 0 or 5. Okay? If we have a population where everyone knows their age, and we have a large sample, this number will be 20. And that will then imply that z is 5 over 4 times 0 is 0. It will say that no one's enumerate, right? And so if we have a population and it comes out that that number is one-fifth or, or, or 20 percent, then we know that we're actually in a society where everyone knows what age they are. Suppose we're in a society where no one knows their age, and so everyone just guesses a number that ends in a 0 or a 5. It's just an approximation to how old they are. Uh, this number then will be 100. Minus 20 will make it into 80, and that's why we multiply it by 5 over 4, because that'll make it back to 100. And so the, the range of this variable here will be between 0 and 100. And z then is just a measure of what share of the population is actually enumerate within this society. So it's just telling you what fraction of these people don't actually know their age, either because they don't understand numbers very well, or because you're living in a society where numbers are so little used that you don't actually have any kind of understanding of what age you are. Okay? Now, what we can do then is we can find you know, signature evidence on, on ages goes back to about uh, 1550 or something like that. No, sorry, signature evidence on literacy goes back to about 1550 in Europe. But we can actually go back all the way to the Roman world using this age heaping measure to get an idea of uh, numeracy in that world. And numeracy and literacy tend to be closely associated. So societies where there's a high degree of illiteracy tend to also be ones where there's a high degree of age heaping and a high degree of innumeracy, right? And so it's just a general measure of the importance of numbers and literature within these societies can actually be conveyed just by how much age heaping do you observe in these societies. And what's the evidence from the ancient world? Well, it turns out that for the Roman period, we get a lot of evidence on age heaping from tombstones because there's a lot of tombstones that give the name of the person, but also the age at which they died, right? And those are the kind of things that survive from the Roman period. And, and the room, tombstones also tend to be for upper class people. You have to be rich in order to get a tombstone. And in fact, to get a tombstone that'll survive that is really hard rock, you have to be very rich, okay? And so you actually get an insight then into the upper classes of ancient Rome and their degree of numeracy. And what's interesting about these tombstone measures is that the implied innumeracy for the upper classes in ancient Rome, at the time they're buried, 40 to 50 percent of these people, they don't know what age they are when they're burying them, right? About half of the upper classes in ancient Rome, in the Roman Empire, it's not known to their relatives at the time they bury them what actually their age is. Another thing we get from this tombstone evidence is that it's clearly the case that they have no concept of, of serious concept of ages in that society. We think that life expectancy at birth in ancient Rome was maybe as low as 30. There are significant numbers of people who are being put into the ground and, and said to be 120 years old, right? There are people who are being buried there who are older than the oldest recorded human being. And so it's both the kind of the heaping and also just the fantastic distribution of ages of the people, which is just far too high, right? That suggests that they just didn't understand age. And the, the amazing thing is when you buried your father and said he's 120 years old, why didn't anyone say that's absolutely ridiculous? That would mean he'd have to have been a friend of Caesar's or something like that. You know, that's not plausible. <laughs> we know, you know, that, that you know, he, he only got married 30 years ago. And so, it, as I say, it's just astonishing that amongst the upper classes in ancient Rome, there is this surprising lack of age awareness and knowledge. Okay, more on that uh, next time. And then also, uh, this is us finishing chapter 9. Have a look at chapter 10. Okay, before next time.
tired already. <laughs> <laughs>